Please pray with me. <clears throat> Living God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace. And in the renewal of our lives, make known your glory through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, today we have a reading from Genesis 15, verses 1 to 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look towards heaven and count the stars, if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord. And the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm is Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends out from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your foes. Your people will offer themselves willingly on the day you lead your forces on the holy mountains. From the womb of the morning, like dew, your youth will come to you. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter heads over the wide earth. He will drink from the stream by the path. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Hebrews 6, verses 13 to 20. When God made a promise to Abraham, because he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently endured, obtained the promise. Human beings, of course, swear by someone greater than themselves. And an oath given as confirmation puts an end to all dispute. In the the same way, When God desired to show even more clearly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it it by an oath. So that through two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible that God would prove false, we who have taken refuge might be strongly encouraged to seize the hope set before us. We have this hope, a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters the inner shrine behind the curtain where Jesus, a forerunner on our behalf, has entered, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And from John chapter 2, this is when Jesus cleanses the temple. and In a sense, what he's doing is symbolically destroying the temple, which would then be destroyed in 70 A.D., But in this act, he is symbolically destroying the temple, and he himself would eventually replace the temple as the place where sin is dealt with and where uh, human beings find the place where heaven and earth overlap. John 2, verses 13 to 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. 
He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So we are continuing our Epiphany sermon series where we are dealing with questions that have been submitted by the congregation. So uh, members of the congregation submitted questions and that's what we're dealing with uh, during the sermon series. So today's question is this. In Hebrews 6, there's a verse about it being impossible for God to lie about these two things. And I'm not sure. What are these two things? It's an interesting question, and uh, it lets me be a bit of a, a Bible geek, so, <laughs> so I really appreciate it. We heard this part of Hebrews read for us today. Uh, we are looking specifically at Hebrews chapter 6, verses 7 to 18, and we're kind of going to get into the weeds a little bit here, so if you're interested in opening up your Bible, if you have one with you, feel free to do so. It might be a little bit easier to follow along. So the New International Version, the NIV, says it this way. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. So we want to know what these two unchangeable things are. That's what we're investigating today. So it may be helpful to start by saying something about what the letter of the Hebrews is about in general. So we don't know who the author of the letter is. Uh, They seem to be a very skilled preacher, and some people think of this as a sort of a sermon, this letter as a a sermon. And so they're a very skilled preacher, a very skilled interpreter of Scripture. They know their Scripture very, very well. The author says that they heard the gospel from those who heard Jesus. This is in uh, chapter 2, verse 3. So the author is a a second-generation believer and also has very, very good Greek, so well-educated, someone who knew the original disciples. This letter was probably written between 50 and 70 AD. The temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, and it would have been incredibly strange for the author to not include that event, given the kinds of things that the author is speaking about in the letter. So... Uh, This is written 20 to 40 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus by someone who knew the original disciples of Jesus. And it seems to have been written to Jewish believers in Jesus as the Messiah. So they have a a very, he assumes that they have a very thorough understanding of the Old Testament. Uh, The name of the letter tells us that it was written to people who are of Hebrew ancestry, written a letter to the Hebrews, right? Um, It is assumed that they were very familiar with the stories of Abraham, the creation of the nation of Israel, uh, the covenant with Moses on Mount Sinai, the wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, and the priestly sacrifices in the temple. So these are themes that you'll find throughout the letter, and he assumes that they know these things in detail. This group seems to have been distancing themselves from the broader Christian community. So they were believers, and they're now entering a time of, of doubt. They're distancing themselves from the broader Christian community. And they seem to have been enduring suffering and persecution. And they also seem to be doubting whether Jesus really dealt with sin. So the letter is written to encourage this community that God has, in fact, spoken his ultimate and final word in his son, Jesus. So to abandon the son, this is how important this is. So to abandon the son is to walk away from God. This is how important it is to pay attention to God's son, Jesus. 
the author wants to show that Christ is superior to all that came before and to encourage them to remain faithful. The letter shows how Jesus is superior to all the previous ways that God has revealed himself before. Superior to the angels who delivered the law to Moses on Sinai. Superior to Moses who built the tabernacle in the wilderness. Superior to the priests and the sacrificial system that offered sacrifices to deal with the sins of the people. So Jesus is superior to all of those other methods and all of those other revelations. The author also highlights a number of heroes of the faith. Uh, heroes of faith, actually, rather. So examples of faithfulness that, that are found in Scripture. So these are people who trusted in God. That's what faith means, it's trust. Abraham, for example, trusted in God's promise that he would have a son with Sarah, even in their old age, even though he still, even in their old age, had to wait for many years for that promise to be fulfilled. Likewise, the readers are then encouraged to remain faithful to Jesus even though they are dealing with hardships and the promise isn't being fulfilled as soon as they had hoped. So God's people can have full confidence in God's Son, the perfect high priest who gives all people access to God. That's, that's what uh, the author is trying to encourage them to Right. Stay faithful to Jesus. God will be faithful to his promises. So that's the overview of the book of Hebrews. And what we want to do now is, is zoom in on the section that is related to the question that we have. So the section we're looking at is speaking about God's trustworthy promises in light of Jesus, the greatest high priest. So the author references Psalm 110, which I read. Um, he, and he uses that to talk about this, especially the mention of Melchizedek. Uh, Melchizedek is a pretty mysterious figure from Genesis 14. He is both the king of Salem. Uh, this is in the future would become Jerusalem, right? Jerusalem. So he is the king of Salem and he is the priest of God. And this is unusual because Abraham meets this person who somehow knows the God who is talking to Abraham. And some of the early church fathers and others thought that this was a manifestation of, of perhaps the, some sort of divinity, um, God speaking, uh, or an angel speaking to, uh, speaking to Abraham. So a, a theophany sometimes it's called, a manifestation of God to, to, speak, to, um, to speak to Abraham. Some even thought even... Uh, the Son of God appearing, uh, manifesting in, in this way to Abraham. So there was this idea that this Melchizedek foretold or was representative of the Messiah who was to come. So he is this mysterious figure from Genesis 14, and he is both the king of Salem and the priest of God, and he brings out bread and wine to Abraham and blesses Abraham. This is Genesis 14, verses 17 to 24. So Psalm 110, verse 4, is uh, seen in reference to the Messiah. And it says this, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So God's promise, which we just heard, right? God, um, God has sworn... <laughs> Right, that's the promise. God's promise about the Messiah's priesthood is confirmed by his oath in the same verse, which makes his promise absolutely guaranteed. God promised and he swore an oath. So Jesus' priesthood is explained to be of a higher order, the order of Melchizedek, who was uh, a king and priest. And it's probably worth saying something about this reference to swearing an oath. So this is a different order of speech, and we do this in our own culture as well. I can make a passing comment that I'll come by and shovel your walk when it snows, and if something comes up and I don't do it, you might be a little bit annoyed at me, uh, but it, it's probably not a big deal because it kind of said it in passing. But if I swear an oath that I'm coming to shovel your sidewalk when it snows, in, in a sense, I'm signing on the dotted line. It's something that you could bring me to court over. You could sue me over that because I made a very uh, 
serious promise. So my trustworthiness is on the line at that point. There are consequences if I fail to keep my word, if I sign on the dotted line a promise. So our Hebrews reading is saying that God swore an oath, and he's done this before in Genesis 22, verse 16, and Psalm 110, verse 4, right? So these are examples of when God swore an oath. God made this higher level of speech where people are held accountable for their words, for their promise. God's trustworthiness is on the line regarding, in regard to this oath. So God makes an oath. He wants to be clear to those who inherit the promise. The readers are among those who inherit this promise, a promise that was given to Abraham. So a promise was given to Abraham, which was confirmed by an oath, which said that he would eventually have a son who would become a nation, and this came to be. Right? This, um, Abraham did become a nation. His descendants became a nation. So God's promise, which he made with an oath to Abraham, resulted in it becoming true eventually. It took time. Abraham had to be patient, but it did come true. So this is the same kind of promise and oath given to the Christian community regarding the high priesthood of Christ. And we read about that in Psalm 110, verse 4. Um, and this is repeated over and over again in the book of Hebrews, a letter to the Hebrews. So what does Jesus do as a priest of the order of Melchizedek? So this is tied to the promise and to the oath. So this is the promise of the new covenant, where Christ is the heir of all things, and the inheritor of all things, where God speaks to his people through his son and he has achieved redemption and purification for his people through his blood, through his work as this new high priest of a different order. So there is the promise and there is the oath that confirms the promise in this higher order of speech. The promise and the oath are both unchangeable and irrevocable because they're made by God. For God to break the promise or the oath would be for God to be a liar, which is impossible because it's outside of God's character. The promise and the oath are in reference to the high priesthood of Christ in the order of Melchizedek. So that's, that's what this is in reference to. Right? The two things are the promise and the oath. The passage goes on to talk about hope. Right? And our hope is synonymous with God's promise regarding what we have been given and will be given through the redemptive act of Christ. So this hope is an anchor for our soul. This promise is an anchor for our soul. An anchor gives stability to a ship. It holds it in place and keeps the ship from being smashed against the rocks. Right? It holds it deep into the, into the water, to the ground. Our hope is in Jesus, our high priest. The, the earthly high priest in the Jerusalem temple would enter the Holy of Holies. This is behind the curtain in the temple. He would go into the temple once per year the Holy of Holies was considered the holiest place on the entire planet. There was no holier place than, than the Holy of Holies to them. So Jesus, our high priest, has entered into the heavenly Holy of Holies, the most holy place even in heaven. And he has done that on our behalf. He is in the direct presence of God, and he is our anchor. And so imagine everyone who believes in Jesus has a rope that they're holding on to. And that all of these ropes all lead the way into the heavenly holy of holies and are tied around Jesus, who is our anchor. So he anchors us to the presence of God in the heavenly holy of holies. And he will even lead us into that most holy presence, we might be in the midst of a storm. Our lives might feel like they're a wreck. 
But if we hang on to that rope, we will not be smashed against the rocks. How do we know the anchor will hold? God has sworn by an oath that Jesus is our high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And according to the author of the letter to the Hebrews, for Jesus to not be, trust, not be a trustworthy anchor would mean God is a liar. So either Jesus is able to anchor us to God in the storms of our life, or God is a liar, which is impossible. So that is, is the answer to the question. I hope that is helpful, and I hope that's reassuring for, for all of us to know that Christ anchors us to God. Amen.